start sharing. Oops, sorry, to start sharing what is upcoming. Um, and then the students wanted me to improve breakout room engagement from participants. And so I started to create some strategies. So that's how I connected the end of last class to the beginning of this class to kind of make them all flow together. Warm up activities would range from, um, you know, a small meditation, a padlet, an IDEO 30 circles activity, just to really get students in the mindset of, okay, we're here in class, I'm gonna use my brain, especially at 8 a.m. Um, and so that, that kind of is explanatory. I would then practice what I've termed kind of transparent pedagogy um, and really try to debrief and help students make connections to two things. One, the habits of mind, and two, postgraduate life. Um, how does what we're doing right now in this moment connect to later on? I facilitated this um, for those who are in person in the classroom, we'd sit in their chairs. For those who are um, on Zoom, you know, they could turn off their camera and, and do whatever activity. Asynchronously, um, what I would do is I would give a recap video. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more um, later on in the agenda where I'd ask them to pause their video, do the activity, and then unpause. Um, so that's how I'm capturing those three um, different, different sets of students. Then we'd go into um, the main activity. My course is a project-based course. Uh, so we could be doing anything from working it with partners on infographics to working on a project proposal or even meeting with community members during class time. So this main activity could look different from day to day. Sometimes I can fit one or maybe two classes uh, in. For example, one of the classes, the students took their project proposal and they had to turn words into a physical prototype with two students in the classroom, two students on Zoom and one participating asynchronously as part of their groups. We laughed a lot. Um, I just used materials from around my house and backyard and to see what the students came up with. One set of students made a um, prototype of a test kit and they used a stick and they wrapped the, the, the head of the stick around with a bunch of yarn and it was a cotton swab. And I was like, that's so creative. But really the purpose there was to help them think about how a proposal in words, how it has so much more power when you're talking to an audience and you have something to showcase that's physical, that prototype to get across your idea. We would then, um, we would reflect and debrief on our activities. And then the closing is where I bring everyone together I would talk about the due assignments. I'd even go to our course website and show everything. I'd preview the next class um, and then you know, give them the information they needed before the ticket to leave. I wanted to start this presentation talking about the agenda because for me, this is the foundation of everything I do. This is how I prepare, how I anticipate what questions, how I'll come up with seven different activities and realize only two of them align with my course object objectives for that day. So why don't I wait? Um, Really, it comes back to what one of my mentors said, which is to do more with less, um, to really make sure that I'm not packing too much into a class. What I also recognize is after I implemented this um, agenda system very, very like consistently, it was around week three, I started to see my students kind of settle into themselves a little bit. That could be because it was week three and they're settling in as first years. But I also think it's because the rhythm of my class really helped them create some consistency in a world that was just not so consistent. Um, high flex was really hard on me as an instructor in terms of time consumption, but also for students of figuring out how to navigate what to do. My first agenda took like an hour and a half to create. So I wanna own for you that if you are really wanna try this out, that to acknowledge it, it might be hard the first time, but after that you find your rhythm and you figure out, um, you'll be even thinking about in the current class, ooh, I wanna do this for the warm up next time. Um, and it will just really fall into place. But I wanna acknowledge that it takes a little bit to lift it the very first time. So I'm gonna stop sharing this um, and talk to you next about the course website. I'm gonna share my screen again. That's something I also noticed as an instructor with high flex. I literally narrate my every move. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else did that, but I was like, I'm closing the chat now and now I'm opening this. And I felt like it um, helped me to not feel like there was dead air for some reason, like I'm giving a podcast or performing. So you get to experience that too. Um, so here's my course website. So again, students could get here right from um, their Moodle page. 
what you might notice is this looks pretty similar to a syllabus course outline. What I tried to do was to um, make my syllabus virtual. So this is all through a SharePoint site that through the settings, I invited each of my students with permissions um, to come into this class that I created. They'll get a broad overview of the entire semester just by scrolling through to the finals week. They can see an image of me. They can see my contact information, how to book an appointment, their group project folders, participant folders, our textbook, um, and then our syllabus. Really anything that they would need is all here on our course website that is just accessible to my group of students. Now what they could do is um, they could take a deeper dive here into one of the weeks. So if you click on week seven, then students will get to see, all right, what are we doing this week? Each of the weeks um, I've outlined into a format you'll see is very much like eighth, which is engage, the agenda, review, reflect and discuss, and then do assignments over here on the right. And so um, on this day, students could log in and see which group or who was face to face and who was online. For those participating asynchronously, what I realized from week one um, through week three was they were kind of an afterthought. If anything, what I did was I recorded my sessions, I posted them, and just expected my students to watch 100 minute lectures. Um, one night I was sitting down with my agenda and I was thinking about those asynchronous students and I was like, well, I'll watch a session and see. It was awful. I was like, I was trying to do other work while I'm listening and I was like, well, if this is how I feel, my students must feel like that too. So. My class I, I had said at the beginning was 8 to 9.40. And what I then started to do is I'd end class at 9.30 for those on Zoom and in person. And I took that remaining 10 minutes to really focus on my asynchronous students. So I would hit record and I'd say, welcome to week seven, class number one. This is the overview video of what we did today. I'd go through the agenda. I'd pause at the warm up and say, so what I want you to do now is take out a piece of paper and draw 30 circles, set a timer on your phone, and in 30 seconds, turn as many of those as you can into different objects. Um, as part of the agenda that you see for this session, I actually gave you um, a link to one of my YouTube recap videos. So if you wanna go ahead and review that, um, definitely hold space. It's a work in progress. Sometimes I felt kind of crazy just in my office talking to my screen, but um, any improvements that you see, just let me know. But I wanted to give you a model of what it might look like. Um, so for those asynchronous students, they'd watch that 10 minute video recap and then I'd have them fill out this asynchronous feedback form. I'm actually going to click on that for you so you can see it. So I created one form um, in Microsoft Forms and I just replicated, duplicated that form for each class. I tried for the first question, it's the same question as the ticket to leave, what are two to three takeaways you have from, I tried to make it specific for that class so they had to watch that recap video. Um, you know, the project proposal and habits of mind activity from today's class, what's going well for you, and how can I improve the experience. This is also a great way just to give a check in to those students who are asynchronous. Um, they might not have another platform to be able to ask you um, or tell you how things are going. I did have to put a calendar reminder to check these. I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I would forget, um, but I would always do it when I logged attendance. So when I would be in Moodle, I would say if a student was absent, I would check this form. When I would log them as uh, participating asynchronously, I would put present. You can actually type in the notes next to each of them um, and I would put asynchronous so I would know I could go back to this form. All right, I'm gonna go back. So that kind of talks a little bit about the asynchronous students. Um, as I said, I'm definitely in process. I've only been, um, I've only been teaching for about three years as a teaching lecturer, so I could improve and I definitely want to improve on the asynchronous side, but this was the best that I could do in fall. So if you have any tips or tricks for asynchronous, drop them in the chat. I'm going to try and just save the chat after this so that I can review those too. Um, this is where I'd give a link to the agenda for students, much of what uh, you saw when I first opened up. I just kind of gave an overview, the warm up, the activity. A lot of times if students needed to go to a PowerPoint link or a Padlet, this is where I would hyperlink that. I didn't, it's kind of a duplication of efforts, but I didn't want them to have to have three or four clicks deep in order to get to the resource. I wanted it to be right there for them. 
And then this would be if you wanted to put readings. Um, so I actually, I worked a lot with um, Dr. Kim Livingstone from Social Work where we, where her class looks pretty similar to this. Um, she created a course website. So this is where she would put all of her readings. For me, I didn't have a lot of readings for the class, um, but when I did, I would put the articles here. Lastly, there was the reflect and discuss. And so I'm going to, um, transition this over to show you the teams because all of the discussions were based on the team's website, but they would get their prompt here. I also posted in teams. And if you click on week seven discussion, it would go ahead and bring you right to our team's site. So I'm gonna open Microsoft Teams. And there we are, we're at week seven. And so you can see these are all of my students' posts. Um, so pausing, why Teams? I chose Microsoft Teams because it is a platform that is used um, by many companies for communication. I mean, look at all of us utilizing Teams for January Jamboree, for many of our other um, groups and things that we're working on. So I thought it was a huge connection to post-grad life of learning uh, a system that could really help with communication and project management. So that's really the reason I chose Teams. And along the way, I found some tips and tricks that I'm gonna share with you too. Email for my first year students was something that I struggled with in the past. They wouldn't respond to my emails, but they will respond to a Teams private chat. I will tell you, um, I prompted them each to put it on their phone. They would call me through Teams. They would video chat me um, through Teams. We could see when each other was on Teams in the evening. So they'd see that I'm grading and they say, hey, Kayla, I have a question on X. That might be a little bit of a breach of kind of like your boundaries. You can definitely set that with your students, but I found that it was a great way to connect with them pretty quickly, um, kind of in the manner that they enjoy, which is on their, their mobile phone. Really that accessibility piece from the ACE framework is what I tried to model with Teams and the SharePoint. Both platforms are very mobile user friendly. You can open them easily on your phone, I knew that many times over the past year, I've actually had to go to you know McDonald's and sit in the parking lot and do my work because we lost internet at home or we lost power. So I knew that my students were the same and I wanted them to be able to participate in class. One of the things that I found um, on Teams, which I'm gonna try to maximize this so you can see, was the grading piece. Um, how do you find if your student made a discussion? Up here in the search bar, if you backslash find, and Lori, you can see what I'm doing on Teams. I just want to check to make sure. Okay, good. Um, you can write in week seven discussion and you can type in a student's name. And on the left, it's going to show you all of their posts for week seven. This was so helpful when I was going to check off. I practice ungrading. So really it would be more of, you know, did they complete it or was it incomplete? I could also see when they replied to others. Um, teams also made it so that I could have Ryan Patton, who works in admissions, be part of one of our um, discussions for the week. So I wanted my students to reflect back and share any advice that they would have for incoming students. And so I was able to invite Ryan right into the teams. To be honest, it gave me a break for a week of responding to discussions because Ryan was like, I'd be happy to respond. Um, so found like little tips and tricks of how to figure out ways that I didn't have that huge burden of it's not a burden to respond to students, but let's be honest, it takes a lot of time, um, especially when you have 30. So, so that really helped. The, the one thing I would say I wanted to improve with teams was I just, I didn't respond as quickly on the discussions. I was so caught up in the planning of the agendas of making sure the course website was up to date that I think in spring, knowing that I have all of this set up, I'll be able to be better at responding to my students' discussions. Um, I connected with a mentor who said, actually, that's okay if you don't respond poignantly to each one. Um, in fact, if students are responding to one another and it's creating their own little space where they, they can connect, that's okay. So it kind of took that pressure off of me as a faculty member. Um, the other thing, I'm going to close out of Teams here um, so that way we're back onto the course website. The other thing I want to acknowledge is... Um, the fact that this could be really hard at first for students. Uh, the first couple of weeks, my students would come to me like, okay, so help me understand SharePoint and Teams and what's the difference with Moodle. 
And so if you are going to, to run a high flex course through these, these tools, I just want to acknowledge it's going to be hard for students the first couple of weeks. Sit with them in that process. That's a learning opportunity in itself. Um, and just, you know, acknowledge that it, it can be difficult, but I did record a video, which is what, what I did here. You can find it in the agenda too, um, as a session, as a session attendee, where I actually gave you the video where I give a tour of Moodle, SharePoint, Teams, and give you the difference between the, the three. Um, so it could be hard for students to understand, but, but it is a learning opportunity all the same. I also want to recognize that um, and I shared this with my students in the last week. Week one, you can actually see my process change as a faculty member in terms of what things look like to week seven. I had wanted to really like improve it, make it all look the same. And then I realized that it's okay for students to see me in process as an instructor. Um, and so to kind of see my multiple drafts. And I really tied that into the fact that my work is out there and it's a work in progress and they would find edits for me and I would go in and fix them and I'm like that's okay you know we're all a work in progress. Um, so the last thing that I, I want to talk about would be that ticket to leave um, as part of the class so i'm going to stop sharing because I think we've reviewed that so the ticket to leave would be. I would end the class again at 930 I actually got this from Barb McCann who would do it with her students to check for understanding in a notebook. So I was like, how do I do this via high flex? So there's a video um, in the agenda called how to do um, a virtual ticket to leave. So you can review how I use the tools. But basically I wanted to ask my students, what are two to three takeaways that you have from today's session or today's class? Anything you wanna share with me or anything that could be improved? Um, some of the things that I received from students were funny. Uh, one student told me that I need to remember my computer charger. And I was like, I totally do. I kept forgetting it and my computer would die. So I'd have to run upstairs. Um, another student told me, you know, I'm in class, but you never look at me. You just look at the Zoom participants. And I was like, oof, I do because I'm so nervous and I'm trying to manage so much at one time. And so that was really helpful to get that feedback. There are also days where um, I thought I nailed it and the students were just like, yeah, it's all right. Or days where I left class and was like, that was the worst ever. I don't, I don't know, I'm never doing that warm up again. But the reviews were great. They're like, I really love this, this is how it fits in. Um, so it gave me this real time feedback that kind of kept me better in tune with my students. Um, I actually got this from a book called The Art of Possibility um, in collaboration with what Barb said where the um, he was a music conductor and he would leave a blank page on each music stand and each musician, no matter their capability or, um, you know, what they played could give feedback. Um, and so this conductor gave a lot of his success to the fact that he got feedback from the members um, of his orchestra. So that's where I got that from. So, so far, just kind of in quick recap, because I want to leave time and space for your questions and what you want to do. Um, I went over the tools that I've utilized. I talked about how I prepare for class with the agenda. Um, I talked about the rhythm of my class and how I developed consistency for students. And then I talked about that asynchronous piece with the form and the video recap. So what questions do you have? I know I see some in the chat, but I haven't read them all. Kayla, it will not be surprising that there's lots of questions because okay. the work you do is so generative. Um, so I'm just going to throw a couple of these out here. Um, and people, if I don't do them in order, don't worry. I'm going to make sure I get everything. Um, so one question um, that Becky had, and actually this was a question that I had when you and I were, and I don't think I've ever asked you, is there any particular reason with the ticket to leave why those need to be separate forms? Could you have a single form where students just check off if they're um, synchronous or asynchronous, or is there a reason why you wanted those? Um, yeah, you separate. could totally do it as one form. In fact, I think Julie Bernier did that with her attendance form. So it was just a, a single form that students would fill out. Um, because it date stamps it for you and you can see the student's name and the date. I think the reason that I did them as separate forms was more for me. I like to check things off. And so when I could just go in and focus on one form and the responses from that form, it was really helpful. Um, and, but yeah, you could totally modify it. What are your takeaways? You could ask them to put the class date that they're filling it out for because the date they fill it out might not be the the class that they're filling it out for. So just think about that. Um, 
But yeah, that would totally be way more efficient um, than making. No, super. Student. I think it's a great observation too that it probably depends a little bit on your teaching style. Like you said, yep. for some of us, it's like having these in separate spaces where you can look at them in compartments is really useful. But for others, it might be that a, a holistic view is a little yeah. bit more um, natural. Um, Lynn was asking. I know that I, th I think you just taught one section of this TWP. Is that correct? Yes. Um, yep. She was wondering if you were doing additional sections of a single course, would you, do you think it would be possible to just have one SharePoint site um, for all of those sections or the way that you set it up? Does it really need to be a unique space for each, um, for each group? That's a great idea. I think for efficiencies, if you were teaching the exact same class, you could definitely utilize the same website. Um, the only thing I would say is maybe your recap videos would be a bit different for each population just because different things happen in the classroom with different sets of students and you might be at a different point. Um, but say you were doing that, I would just be transparent with your students and say I'm running another section, maybe even your team site, you know, combine and your students from both sections are connecting in there. That would be amazing, I would think, from terms of you're, you're expanding your students participating. But again, I don't know what the university stands on is, but I think it's cool. <laughs> I'll say that um, I've had some experience um, in teaching multiple sections, uh, both where I was the instructor for both sections, but when there were other instructors teaching, teaching the same class, um, but at different times and days. And I have used some of these tools um, across those sections. And what I would just say is that there's um, there's some really interesting affordances like when you get everybody in the same group you just have so much more um uh there's just there's just so much more potential activity but there are you know there's a little bit of a trade-off because obviously from section to section sometimes the messaging is a little different sometimes dates have been shifted um or like you said you've covered things in a different order or you've gone down a different path so you do have to be kind of mindful of that so students don't feel like they've um kind of lost track of of their particular sections work um jennifer was asking how you went about integrating sharepoint with moodle um can you talk a little bit about what that looked like absolutely so on the left hand side of my moodle page and i can show it to you i can't remember what these are called so please help me i think i saw it from something that you did martha um you can embed a link here on the left hand side um, so I uploaded an image and hyperlinked that image to the site. Is that correct, Martha? I, I don't think that's for me because I'm so Moodle um, sort of novice because I never used it before I came to PSU. And um, But I, I've seen similar, I know I've seen in courses like Jason has shown and other have shown similar kinds of blocks. I really love that because that probably stays there whenever you're looking at a page with that sidebar. Yeah. Um, so it really yeah, gets Kathy, Kathy LeBlanc this morning. I think she called that an H the HTML editor block. There you go. Yep. So you uh, can do you can do just about anything with that if it's just um, free HTML. And that's a really great use of it as to just create kind of a standing spot for students yep. to always find that content. Um, let's see. Becky, I'm still looking into whether there's an app for SharePoint. It's kind of a Oh. a side conversation, but I've been talking to Hannah about that and I don't, I don't really know. I mean, obviously SharePoint sites, you can just um, access in your browser. Um, you do have to authenticate because they're Plymouth specific, but I think that's pretty straightforward. I don't think that's a stumbling block for students. Did you have students have any no. trouble with that, Kayla? One thing I did, um, so I had to work with Ken Cochin before he um, mm -hmm. kind of stopped promoting or his role changed from promoting teams a lot, um, was that, he, so when I created a Teams, it automatically created my SharePoint. Yep. So they're connected. So I, for when I was first starting this, I made a SharePoint and made a Teams, and then they weren't connected. And so um, I can actually share my screen to show you my Teams again. The other thing you can do is right from the uh, Teams app, you can access home and home is my course website. It should be mapped, but I changed my homepage later on <laughs> in the class. Um, so you can click you can um, click settings and it will map you right back to home. So for example, I did my virtual exercise class from here and that should map right to the homepage. So this is my course website. 
and it yeah. linked to the Teams page. We used this technique um, a little bit in ACE last summer. And I'll say that um, those tabs at the top of Teams that you can set to a page are so useful. The only drawback to them that we experienced was that um, it's like a little mini browser in Teams that displays a web page, but it's not a full featured browser. So when you start clicking away from stuff, you can't go back the way you can in like right. Chrome or Firefox. So it's great if it's just a single page that you need people to be able to get to and access all the content that's on there. But it's not necessarily the place where you really want your students to experience the entire SharePoint or whatever web page because they'll be limited in terms of browser capabilities. I also saw that Becky, to answer your question really quick, the teams, I created, I think it was a classroom team. So when you go click make new yep. team, you have some models you can go off from. And I learned from Kathy to make a blank team. Don't yep. go off any of the templates because sometimes you'll get those tabs are preset for you. And I didn't like that. And, and it's a really good point. It seems kind of like, oh, well, I'm doing a course site. I should choose the class or course template. Um, but not only do they go ahead and create some stuff for you, I've also discovered that once it's set up, it's there's certain things you can't add once you've chosen that template, certain features. Yeah. So the blank one just gives you a completely blank canvas. Um, Lynn was also um, wondering how much teaching of how to use Teams did you have to do with your students to help them orient? That's a good question. Definitely the first two weeks, I kept routing students back to that intro video where I give a video tour of Teams and the meaning. Um, and then in my introduction for the first two to three weeks, I would just, you know, quickly recall. So remember, our course website is this. Moodle is used for this. And Teams is utilized for discussion. Um, I would even, you know, walk through it with your students in class, show them the click patterns. After the first couple of weeks, so they start to really get it, especially after they saw students adding onto the discussions. Um, I also would really try to pull myself out of those questions sometimes and look to another student. Um, mm -hmm. So that way they're speaking student to student on Zoom or in the classroom. Um, I, and that would give me time to set up breakout rooms. I'd be like, actually, Mateo, you, you know, you navigated teams. Can you talk to the student and tell them about it and then give them a moment, which gave me a moment as well. One of the things that I've done really successfully using, um, I, I haven't actually taught much with teams just because I wasn't teaching during um, all of this going on with COVID this fall, but um, I've used Slack before, which is a kind of, kind of a competitor of teams. And one of the things I've done really successfully in Slack is set up a channel that's uh, like tech support or questions and answers. And I encourage students to post there and then I encourage them to answer each other's responses. And I'll even do like some um, portion of their grade based on supporting each other. Like usually they have to tell me, you know, do a, write a quick self-reflection about how they helped out other classmates. Um, it's a good way to kind of encourage it and to get them to realize that I'm not the only holder of the expertise in the room. Absolutely. So Barb was asking, why did you choose to use Teams and Share? Like a very fundamental question. Why did you choose Teams and SharePoint over Moodle? Yeah, so I, um, I was locked out of my house one day participating in ACE. And I had this aha moment as I'm sitting in my driveway taking my Wi-Fi that I wonder how Moodle is accessible on my mobile phone. And mm -hmm. it was awful to navigate. Maybe Canvas is going to be a lot better, but it I was is. able to do my week's homework for ACE and the next week, literally just sitting in my driveway on my small mobile phone. And so that's when that was really my big um, motivator to say, I've got to do this for my students. And many of them were, they were driving during class and being on Zoom. They're listening as if it was a podcast. Some of them were, you know, outside of the waiting room while their parents were getting a procedure done or being seen at the doctors and they're on their phones. So that was really the big premise there. That's such a great point about access and accessibility, Kayla. Um, what a gift to your students for you to have realized how important that was. Um, Hannah, Hannah D, who I haven't seen in a while, said, how did you, um, such a good question, how did you loop the asynchronous HyFlex students into group work? Since group work can be hard in the best of face-to-face -face <laughs> circumstances, imagine that in HyFlex, how did that work? Uh, I had to do a lot of mentoring with my groups um, just around empathy, first of all, <laughs> um, because I think that they came at it with frustration that why is a student not participating? And I was like, have you asked? 
Uh, you know, that was usually my first question, what's going on in their life? And a lot of times they'd say, well, I, I don't really know. Um, and so I, I didn't really set up how it had to happen. I gave the student groups the agency to pick what worked well for them. For some that did not work at all, but I was always there for mentoring to talk through their frustrations or some strategies. So some students would assign that asynchronous person some things to do, and that worked really well. Hey, we're going to meet. We're going to do these things. Can you work on this? Others had the asynchronous person be their eyes on all documents. They were the editor. They were the one who uploaded everything um, and gave ideas via text message. A lot of them participated via Snapchat, which I like was blown away by this. They're, I said, how are you doing group work? They're like, Snapchat. And I was like, so like you take a picture of it and it goes away. They're like, no, Kayla it has a chat feature. So I, I'm totally out of that realm, but that's how they participated. And that was totally fine with me. But it really came back to some of that mentoring in the groups, especially sometimes for those overachievers um, who just want to do all the work that, you know, and, and then they'll say, well, this person isn't participating. And I would always just ask them, is there anything that you're doing that might prevent that person from participating? We always look within, we can't change anybody else, but we can change how we you know, respond and how we set ourselves up for success. And that comes from um, the uh, crucial conversations. They have a whole workbook. I actually give that to my groups. Oh, that's so great. Um, yeah. Worksheet. I can I can upload it as well or send it along. That would be fantastic, Kayla. Very that's cool. such. I mean, that's great group work advice in any circumstance, um, and a really useful um, kind of experience for students to go through. That um, I always say that group work is as much about um, like the interpersonal dynamics and learning to navigate those as it is about the work itself. Like it's yeah. about how to learn work as a group. Um, what an important and often overlooked set of skills involved in that. Um, Becky was asking, and you may or may not be able to answer this, but if you've had a chance to look at Canvas, do you think you might rethink whether or not you would rely so much on SharePoint? Particularly, I will say that I do know Canvas is very mobile friendly for those of you who are new to it. Um, so that piece of it is not as much of a consideration. Um, is that something that you've thought about at all? I don't, at this point, I put so much work into <laughs> the SharePoint that I don't think I, I would. And I, I definitely want to own that. It was, it took a lot of evenings of building, but once I set my templates, like when you saw that week, that week one, um, you know, class one, class two, I just made a template and then I just copied that template over and over and over. Um, so once I set that and I'm happy to help anybody build it, I'm pretty quick at it now. And I actually hyperlinked a YouTube video where I walk you through the process in the agenda. So you can go ahead and reference that if you want to learn how to do it. But no, Becky, I, I think if I could keep my SharePoint, I would do it, but I will definitely give Canvas a try because even though I'm, I'm doing this in my teaching lecturer role, it really has helped inform me in my director role with HHP to help um, teaching lectures, to help other faculty members too, if they come to me with a question or concern, just to kind of like rethink in a different way. Um, so I'll definitely learn Canvas and I'll have to get back to you on it. Um, Jennifer has a question that echoes um, something we've been hearing a lot about, I know the last two days, but also for the last um, couple of months, which is this whole idea of students feeling overwhelmed by tech and tools and you know, choosing to use three different tools, uh, mm -hmm. two of which were kind of new for both you and your students. Did you receive any comments or feedback from students about this? Did you feel like that ended up being a problem? Yeah, so in my very last feedback form, I asked students to give me, so we have the, the um, university feedback and then I give them a qualitative one. And that was the biggest thing was make sure you spend more time talking about your different tools because it was hard at first. Um, for students to, to talk about. So I would definitely acknowledge that with them. Um, I don't think it would make me change, but I would just make more connections to post-grad life. You know, the reason we're using Teams is because in your first job, you might have to learn something like Slack or Teams. And so getting getting yourself in the, into the motion of the process of learning new technology, as hard as it, as it is, I'm gonna hold space for you. I will answer every question. But, you know, let's walk through this process. Let's learn it now so we don't kick the can down the road and you're in that same frustration when you graduate and you're learning something new. But I definitely want to empathize that it's hard to learn new technology. And I, I think what you just said to me is the most important thing, which is it's, it's definitely possible to do this, but 
you have to extend students a lot of grace, um, especially as they're getting started. Um, yeah. You know, I think a lot of students' anxiety about this stems from fear that if they don't have it mastered, they're going to quickly fall behind and there are going to be problems and they're going to, you know, there's a lot of anxiety in that. And so helping students to feel like you have their back, which I know you do, Kayla, um, makes such a difference. Um, and ultimately, I always kind of giggle about it because like I watch my my 15 year old on their phone and I'm like, uh, they switch between apps with like they breathe. <laughs> you know, like, so I know they're capable of this. This is not, it's not a completely foreign concept that there are different spaces for different things, but they just don't think about school that way. I think they, they haven't really been um, given the opportunity to think that way. So, um, you know, helping them get to a place where they realize that, that they can do this and you're not gonna, you know. Yes. And it's I think not gonna affect their grade we model it too in the way that we react to the frustrations in the class so i will own like yeah. navigating zoom and the in person and making sure i was thinking about these asynchronous people those students i had moments of frustration zoom wasn't working like i'm hot under the collar oh my gosh these students are looking at me i'm supposed to know what i'm, I'm supposed to do and so i would stop in that moment and i would even say out loud to my students like i'm really frustrated right now i definitely just want to close out zoom and i was like but that's okay, Kayla, we're going to work through it. And I just kind of like not make fun of myself, but this is what I do with parenting. And, and I don't want to relate teaching to parenting, but our, our kids look to us, you know, when they fall down, if we're like, oh, like that reaction, they look to us and we're modeling. And so I try to remember in the moment that even when I'm frustrating, I'm modeling to my students, the way I accept my struggle, they'll then know I'm extending them to them too. Yep. Oh, that's so great, Kayla. Um, oh, this is a great question from Becky. Um, for your overview videos, did you go back to your office to record those so you didn't have to wear a mask? Like, what was your process for making those videos? Uh, can sure you talk did. a little bit about that? Yeah, I would run back up to my office. I'd shut the door, put, hey, I'm on a Zoom meeting for the last like 10 minutes. And then I would, usually the videos are about like six to eight minutes. You'll see one from the agenda. But yeah, I'd go back to my office. Um, sometimes I would contemplate just waiting and just doing it later because I have to take time out of my work time and then extend my hours as a PAT member in order to teach. So I, I didn't want to cut even more into that, but I would just do it right after the class because otherwise I'd forget. Um, I actually detailed out one day, it's 37 steps from the moment I walk <laughs> into the class to when I upload that video for High Flex. So I also want to own, like for everybody who maybe we're going to teach uh, students at other schools in our classroom. Like this is really, really hard and time consuming. And so if you're trying to do it and you feel frustrated, like I'm holding space for you. If you need like to reach out on teams, it's really frustrating. You're not alone. Um, I, I showed this with a couple of other people and they're like, you make it look so easy. Like your videos, you're so calm. And I was like, that's because you didn't see me so frustrated like 10 minutes ago. I tried to channel it in my videos, but it is really hard. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, uh, from Nicole, did so for your high flex students, did students, did you let them just choose if they were asynchronous versus sync? Did that change? I know I heard from lots of faculty that that was changing on like a, a maybe hourly basis. So how did that play out for you? Um, so in the beginning students, these are first year students, it's fall. So this is their very first semester. So like setting and context is really key. That first couple of weeks, they really wanted their group A, their group B, it was clean. Like I had 15 in person and 15 on Zoom. And you're right, as the semester went on, I just, I tried to be free flowing with the class. Like if you have something come up and you need to be on Zoom, I am so happy that you chose class over sleeping in. Like that was win number one for me. I also found that like agency, even with students choosing how they wanted to engage with class, to me, I wanted to honor that. If they wanted to be in person, that's awesome. If it was on Zoom or if it was later, look at all of us and how our supervisors work with us as staff, as faculty. We have that trust and agency and I wanted to extend that to my students as well. Um, there were some awkward classes where I had one student, so I was like, I am channeling all my enthusiasm to you because you're the only one here, but uh, that was only a handful of times, but it did become a little bit more Zoom focused towards the end, uh, despite students wanting in person, and I just let it be. I didn't take it. My big lesson from fall, um, and I've said it in other venues too, is it's not about me as the instructor. 
like I might be there facilitating the learning, but it's about each individual student and where they're at. If they don't show up, it's not an offense to me. If they plagiarize, it's not so that they think I'm not going to catch it, right? It's just about them in the process. Such good observations. Um, Hannah D was asking um, about leaving Teams classes open from semester to semester. And I'll just, I, um, I'd love to hear your uh, thoughts about this for your course, Kayla, but I will just let everybody know there is a way in Teams to hide old Teams, um, which I do frequently, <laughs> um, because otherwise I would have more than I know what to do with. Um, and I highly encourage you to think about doing that. Um, what about you, Kayla? Are you thinking that you will keep this team um, going once the semester is over? So because my team is connected to my SharePoint, um, about a month ago, I unenrolled my students. Uh, and so the last week I told them that, I said, much like a Moodle course will close, um, you have access to all your documents. So I'm going to put in a private hidden file, all of their folders. Um, and that way my, my new students can't see it, but I just don't want my students to lose their work if they wanted yeah. to use it for a professional portfolio. I think that's such an important point. And it, unfortunately, as somebody who's um, worked in kind of the ed tech sector for a lot of my career, um, that uh, question of like longe longevity and ownership of student work often gets lost in this conversation. And um, for a long time in the LMS, courses would just disappear or students would get unenrolled from them and lose access. Um, at the very least, I think having a conversation with your students and making them aware if you're gonna, if you're gonna turn things off and, or like you, Kayla said, um, making sure they have access to those files is really, really important. Um, I don't tend to ever get rid of anything digital. I totally get rid of stuff in, in real life, but <laughs> digitally I try to hold on to stuff just because I always worry about the student who's like, I had this idea in a course and I need to go back and find it and then discovering that it's gone. So um, let's see, what else do we have? um how did you um deal with the grading in teams like how, was there was it a graded experience was there um, any kind of assessment attached to that activity yeah so their teams um participation so that was their discussion for the week i practice ungrading so i don't assign a letter grade but i will mark items complete or incomplete uh, if it's incomplete i'll put it in the comments saying this is what you need to do to complete it when I show you uh, that backslash, backslash find, that's how I um, was able to identify what students had filled out the discussion forms. Great. Um, and then a question about um, group. Um, sorry, I just blew out a candle because the cat is on the desk and I don't want them to catch <laughs> on fire. Um, a question about group formation. Did you think about just creating groups that were entirely asynchronous students or, or were you very deliberate about distributing your asynchronous and synchronous students together across groups? So I actually, um, Maria Sanders taught me how to scaffold my class in terms of building up to these larger groups. So they actually kind of accumulate each other over the course. Um, the course. They start with a presentation about a topic they choose. Um, then they, based on that presentation, they go into pairs. Those pairs will create an infographic together. Then those pairs will present that infographic and then they have the option of who they wanna self-select as a group of four. So they all selected as they went along. Um, I think Maria in her course had also at that self-selection after the infographics had allowed students to also get up in front of the class and share, here's how I'm a good team member, here are things I want to work on, which I think is brilliant. Students can practice talking about their skills. Uh, I didn't do that in the Zoom setting because I felt like I was already having them do so much and being so vulnerable that it would have put some of my students um, over the edge. So I think you definitely just need to know your class. Yeah. I've seen examples of this and I've done something a little bit like this. I'm gonna, I apologize for using this comparison, but it's a good one of doing almost like a speed dating type thing with students, especially if you're forming groups early in a semester before people really know each other, um, where they circulate around the room, talk about um, things they're interested in, or, or if you have particular topics that you've laid out as possible groups, have them talk about what they'd like to do. And then at the end, they would submit to me or to the faculty member, here are the people I'm most interested in working with. Um, and then you make the final decision. And I kind of like that idea too. 
Um, yeah, I think Kelsey Donnelly did, did it with Zoom um, the first week of her TWP course. So she opened up Zoom rooms and they got to meet each other. I thought that yeah. was awesome. She has it detailed out too, so you could always ask her. Oh, that's great. That's a, that's a great follow-up with Kelsey. Um, Barb was asking about outside um, access to Teams and SharePoint, and I can answer this, Barb. Both Teams and SharePoint are restricted to PSU. Um, I will. I just have to say, as somebody who's a big um, proponent of open pedagogy and open education, there are, if for any reason you wanted something, a, a tool or a space that was a little bit more public or open, there are alternatives that we're happy to talk to you about. Um, but I know that for lots of situations, having a a more locked down space um, for your course um, is really what makes sense, particularly when you're dealing with first year students who are maybe just getting their legs under them in terms of um, in terms of all of this. Let's see, I'm, I'm now catching up. Um, Lori asks, did you offer students in face to face some flexibility to join on the other weekday class? That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, especially later on in the semester, if they wanted to switch it up. Actually, I just opened it up. I said, we don't have group A, group B anymore. Anyone wants to come to class, come to class, because I technically had 20 seats in my classroom, but it was equitable to split it 15 and 15 for my total of 30. I never met my COVID capacity. So I just yeah. kind of, I was flexible. I heard that from a lot of people as well, as much as we were concerned about that going in. Um, Becky, another question. Kayla, did you always require enough participation throughout the class that you could tell they were still paying attention? Did you ever get a ticket to leave that sounded as though the student had been tuned out for some of the time? Absolutely. Yeah. Or or they just didn't fill out the ticket to leave yeah. and they would just bail, right? Um, so what I started to do is some of these PowerPoints where you can see the students working. So these online Microsoft PowerPoints, that was really helpful to see who was participating. Um, but then you just, for some of it, I let it be. It's about their process. And if maybe they weren't feeling that well that class and I'm not gonna be the judge of it. Yep. And these last two questions are kind of SharePoint specific. Um, you, I don't know the answer. You may, whether you can build a SharePoint, for, like use it as a template for another SharePoint. That may be something you haven't run into yet since this was your first go around with it. Um, I think that you can. But so basically you could copy it over to a different one, um, but let's connect and work on it together. I wanna to learn that whoever asked that question. Um, and then Barb also was asking about more training for Teams and SharePoint. And I'll just um, say that that would definitely be in the IT um, wheelhouse to provide that training. Um, and with the consolidation that's been going on over the last year, there's a lot of stuff still in flux in terms of where that, how that training is happening and where the emphasis is. But it does kind of occur to me by what you just said, Kayla, that if there's, if there's some critical interest in this, it might be worth forming a little learning community of faculty who um, are interested in using this. The great thing about both SharePoint and Teams is because they're Microsoft products, there's tons of online um, documentation and help for using these, but having a group of people to work through that with makes it easier than having to find all your own support. So I think we, between a mix of reaching out to IT and then building a little bit of capacity among ourselves, we might be able to do something that people find really useful. And I want to give you, if there's any last things you want to say, Kayla, we got through all the questions and we have three minutes left. <laughs> I just want to give a nod over to the agenda that you have access through um, from the session. So here are, I gave you some resources so that you can continue your enthusiasm for HyFlex. I didn't want you to leave um, and not be able to continue that. So I have a couple of video tours, my welcome, just so you can see an example, um, a Moodle SharePoint syllabus Teams overview, uh, an asynchronous video example, how to create your own SharePoint. I'm going to, I walked you through the process the HyFlex ticket to leave, um, live PowerPoint creation activity and Zoom breakout rooms. And then my favorite, how to utilize Zoom reports to log attendance. So that would be um, the things that I would I would give to you. Awesome. Oh, I did not share my screen, oh, I did. Thank you so much, Kayla. I'm sure You're everybody welcome. here um, would join with me to say that was a great presentation, so much to think about. Um, and with that, I am going to stop the recording. <laughs>